from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carolyn Brown. I'm the director of the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. Um, and I am very pleased to welcome you uh, this afternoon for a lecture uh, by Professor Adib Khalid. The title of Professor Khalid's talk is Between Empire and Revolution. Soviet Central Asia, 1917 to 1932. And before we begin, let me ask you to please, um, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or any other kind of um, electronic equipment so it doesn't go off during the talk or interfere with the recording. This event is sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center, which was established through a generous donation uh, given by John W. Kluge, um, inspired by the Librarian of Congress, J uh, Congress uh, James Billington, librarian, uh, who had a vision of enabling the nation's uh, best leaders to tap the wisdom of mature scholars so that their judgment and knowledge could, the scholars' judgment and knowledge could bring fresh perspectives to that of the legislators and government officials. So the center was de designed to provide a space where we like to say the world of affairs and the world of ideas uh, could come together, where the thinkers and doers would at least have the opportunity um, on occasion to come together for informal conversation. Um, and I will say it doesn't always happen often, but when it happens, it can be quite wonderful. Um, so the center brings highly accomplished senior scholars um, to be part of a community that also includes the world's most promising junior scholars. Um, and together, uh, both, both groups are working in the collections and the library's resources to bring about new knowledge and new uh, wisdom. The center also promotes the scholarly enterprises through lectures such as this one, small conferences, symposium, uh, summer research uh, seminars and so forth. Um, if you're not part of uh, the center's mailing list and you would like to know about um, other upcoming events, you can go to the front page of the Library of Congress. On the right-hand side, you'll see Kluge Center. If you go to the bottom of the Kluge Center's webpage, you'll be able to sign up for automatic notification. Today's lecturer, Dr. Adib Khalid, is currently a distinguished visiting scholar in the Kluge Center. His academic home is Carleton College, where he is the Jane and Raphael Bernstein Professor of Asian Studies and History. His work focuses on a history of non-nomadic societies of Central Asia from the time of the Russian conquest of the 1860s to the present. He is the author of Islam After Communism, Religion and Politics in Central Asia, 2007, which won the 2008 Wayne S. Wayne S. Vucinich Book Prize of the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies, uh, and the 1998 book, The Politics of Muslim, Muslim Cultural Reform, Jadidism in Central Asia. He is particularly interested overall in the transformations of culture and identity as a result of historic change especially the status of Islam under czarist and Soviet rule. Uh, while he's been at the library, he's been working on an aspect of these uh, subjects during that 15-year period I mentioned earlier, um, which will be the focus of his lecture. But he's had an opportunity to delve into a large collection of uncatalogued, rarely used materials in Uzbek from the 1920s that the library owns. And I want to say something about uh, the library's collections in this connection. Um, because we have collections in 460 languages of the world. Um, and people sometimes ask, and they've been asking this question since the time of Thomas Jefferson, you know, why do you need all this stuff written in languages that almost nobody 
or no Americans can read. Like, why do you collect this? Um, and um, Dr. Halid's work really helps answer that question. Um, and if you just think uh, about the current events in Central Asia have, I think I can say fairly unexpectedly, come to have great importance in the 21st century. Um, but how are we going to understand Central Asia and Central Asian states if we don't understand their history? How are we going to understand their history if we're only reading about it through the eyes of English speakers? Um, how are you really going to know a people and what they're thinking unless you can, can read about them and understand them through their own language and their own idiom? Um, and so we collect these materials and in some cases they may sit for a decade or more waking, waiting for um, a scholar such as uh, Dr. Halid to come and use them and then interpret that part of, of history for us at a time when we really need to understand it. And certainly this is such a time. Um, we are a library without a faculty and so it's so important to bring people who can bring the collections to life for us. Um, for that reason and for many other reasons, uh, we're especially happy to have uh, uh, Adib Khalid with us this afternoon to talk about um, this subject, which may seem arcane, and yet I'm sure you will see that it has great relevance to the world we live in, we live in and the way we think about it. So please welcome Dr. Khalid. Thank you very much for such a wonderful and wonderfully generous introduction. Sometimes after introductions like that, <clears throat> I feel that, well, we have already reached the high point of the, of the afternoon. Maybe I should just retire. But, um, well, I promised to give this talk, and I, I will. Uh, but uh, it, it's a great pleasure um, to be here, and thank you to you all for coming. Uh, and uh, before I begin, I'd like to, uh, to thank a number of people. It's been a great privilege to have been at the Kluge Center for the last well, five months. They've gone by quite fast. Uh, it has been enriching in so many ways. Um, uh, all the wonderful people I've met, all the friends I've made. But for all of that, I'd like to thank the Kluge Center and especially the staff, um, in particular, uh, Dr. Carolyn Brown, Mary Lou Recker, and Yvonne French, who have all done wonderful things, without which uh, my stay here would have well, not been possible. Um, I would also like another wonderful thing uh, that this day at the Kluge Center has made possible is to have spent some time with um, Chris Murphy, who is the head of the Neary section here. and. Uh, I first met Chris in 1988, which makes him actually means that I think I've known him longer than anybody else in this room, which is saying quite something. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I had just finished my master's, and I, we had a conversation at a conference in Central Asia about um, uh, someone we'll, uh, uh, we'll encounter in this talk. And um, that conversation actually, in some ways, led to the uh, eventually to my choice of my dissertation topic and um, everything else I've done ever since then. And it's been really uh, uh, um, wonderful to have known Chris for this long and I would like to um, uh, make known my appreciation in public. And it is a particular delight that so many of my family could be here. Uh, I owe them a great deal. The research I've been doing that I'm presenting today has um, gone on for the bulk of my children's lives and has caused many absences on my part. So thank you. And it's a pleasure also to give this talk so close to two significant birthdays in my family. Uh, so happy birthday to Jan Duncan and to, to Leila. Uh, and let this be your present. <laughs> oh, okay, now you'll, you'll get a real present too. Uh, okay, uh, now, uh, the title for this talk is actually the, a working title for the book that I've 
been working on for much too long. I did the spade work for it during the academic year of 2000, 2001, and the world has changed quite a bit since then. Um, I came back and started teaching on September 10th of 2001. And uh, a lot has happened, this, and the research for this book has gone off in many different directions, uh, which means that the, the project sprawls in too many directions. And therefore, I was really particularly grateful to get this wonderful fellowship this year, uh, to have the chance to sit down and um, do the, fi uh, the, f the final research and to f uh, start hammering uh, the writing into some sort of shape. The process of writing has been revealing. It has revealed to me the main argument of the book itself. And this also sometimes happens that the, actually your argument actually really takes its final form in the very process of writing. So what I would like to do today is to present uh, to you the overall argument for the book. Um, and the book covers lots of different things and there's a lot of detail in it. But uh, I think I thought that for a an audience like this, the overall, uh, the overall argument would be the, the way to present. And Carolyn mentioned the, the arcaneness of this topic is uh, very, um, and, and it, I suppose it says something about how, about the relationship between public and professional academic life that what sounds as arcane uh, to, a, to the general public, uh, uh, to my historian colleagues, uh, the, the usual comment I get is you are covering 15 years. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah, so, so there is that. I'll, and I uh, think addressing audiences like this is a way of trying to bridge that uh, gap between the public and the, and the professional. All right, so in the book as a whole, I want to comprehend uh, this these 15 years of massive transformation in Central Asia, uh, which come about as a result of the Russian rule, uh, now the Russian Revolution and the establishment of Soviet rule as a result of it. The transformation was massive and multifaceted. Um, massive uh, uh, traumatic upheavals of war, of economic collapse and famine uh, brought new groups to power, positions of power and authority in local society, while the revolutionary state of which Central Asia became part as a result of the revolution, began to create, um, um, began to enact an agenda underwritten by certain utopian visions of uh, social transformation. Uh, this made this a decade of um, hope and ambition in which local actors seized upon the opportunity presented by the revolution to reshape their own society. Um, the, the seemingly chaotic situation produced far-reaching changes that in many ways map out uh, the contours of Central Asia as we know it today. Um, at another level, my, uh, the book seeks to intervene in a number of uh, broader histories of uh, historiographies of, um, of empire, of anti-imperialism, mo modernity, and modernization to which Central Asia and the Soviet experience have much to contribute, uh, even though they sometimes contribute too little. Uh, uh, because after all, um, Central Asia might have been largely forgotten by the world of scholarship why, during the Soviet period, at least during the 90 years of, uh, 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 sorry, the 70 years of Soviet true, cent Soviet Central Asia was sort of a very little known place. But, for all this oblivion, it experienced all the excesses and all the developments of the 20, that defined the 20th century that made it what it is. So before I um, start, maybe a little um, geography for uh, the audience, and now this is, um, which one should I point to? Uh, 
So, um, I start with the argument uh, in my book that the Russian Revolution of 1917 represented a major turning point for Central Asia, which went from being part of an empire to being engulfed in a revolution. I use empire and revolution as shorthand for describing two vastly different political projects that affected Central Asia in the uh, early 20th, in the first half of the 20th century, and that uh, analogs of which are, are, um, are seen all over the world. Um, empire, in the way I use it, is a way of managing difference that takes difference for granted. The Tsarist empire functioned and certainly until the revolution of 1905 and even after that, explicitly on the notion that the subjects of the Tsar were not equal and universal laws did not apply to them. Rather, uh, the Russian Empire was a particularist empire in which the Tsar received the allegiance and obedience of a vast array of particular groups defined by social status, ranks and standing, location, religion, sometimes even ethnicity. And many of them were governed by their own statutes. The state did not have a universalist vision and it did not seek to engineer society. Uh, as long as law and order was maintained and revenue collected and people stayed where they belonged, the state left its subjects largely alone. Uh, uh, and, and this is actually, in very broad outlines, what we see happening in a lot of other colonial empires. The British in India worked, again, through pre-existing social relations, which they then did actually transform, but nevertheless, they never were driven by a will to uh, at, at, at massive social mobilization or, or the engineering of society. Even though predicated on inequality, this form of tolerance, or at least of toleration, um, uh, uh, this was a form of tolerance or toleration that appears quite attractive to us today, and actually the Russian Empire has made a bit of a comeback in the historiography, and uh, we now tend to see to, uh, more of its positive side, emphasize its positive sides rather than uh, the negative ones that was uh, really the dominant paradigm until the 1980s. Okay, so, so much for empire. Now, revolution, in my usage, represents a markedly different uh, uh, set of political assumptions. It seeks to abolish <coughs> empire's rule of difference and to replace with a universalist dispensation based on the, in, uh, the equality of all peoples. It also seeks to make history, often by undoing what history has wrought to date, and in that, revolution becomes a hugely ambitious uh, project of intervention in society. The, um, uh, the ambitions of revolution, uh, and certainly of the Bolshevik Revolution, come straight out of the tradition of the Enlightenment and have figured large in the history of the 20th century, not always in quite as radical a form, perhaps, as in the Russian Revolution, but, uh, but nevertheless. Uh, today, we are less enthused by the idea of states shaping societies, hindering markets, and trying to give history a direction or a push. Uh, all the more reason, therefore, to remind ourselves as historians uh, uh, of the fascination, the idea of revolution uh, and universalism and universal equality uh, have exercised on many, many intellectuals of, of the 20th century. And the practical effects of this fascination uh, that the, the, this fascination has had on many societies. In Central Asia, there are many such people who saw in revolution the opportunity to radical, radically transform their society. Some of them joined the, uh, the party, some of them, uh, some did not, but all placed uh, uh, great hope in revolution. They worked in Soviet institutions alongside them and sometimes at cross purposes with them. All through the 1920s, again, a decade of hope and ambition. It's the story of these people, the, the people who sought to participate in the uh, uh, local Central Asians who sought to participate in the revolution that uh, I'm interested in. But let's start, let's tarry a little bit with this idea of empire. Um, uh, I, would like, I would like to pick up the point about Russia being a particularist empire and take it a little further. Even in an empire defined by partic particularisms and difference, Central Asia was different 
I mean, there's difference, and then there's difference with a capital D, I suppose. Uh, more in, different, in fact, than any other part of uh, the empire. Uh, and this difference, I have arg argued, makes it distinctly, uh, Central Asia distinctly a colonial possession of the Russian Empire that officially did not actually have colonies. Um, but the, the way the uh, power was, uh, the region was imagined and power were ex was exercised uh, had a lot to do with um, other colonial situations. The Russian conquest of the 1860s changed a great deal. <clears throat> about in the lives of Central Asians that redefined the economy, turned, uh, in, incorporated them into the broader Russian imperial economy, undid all the patterns of trade and all of that. But the state nevertheless let society largely alone. Islamic law continued uh, to be recognized. Uh, and, um, and, and, the, and, and the state basically um, <laughs> Uh, banked on existing patterns of authority, even though it, as it reshaped them. These practices then engendered a certain uh, colonial habitus that made the difference seem natural. It was not just that uh, a native and Russian um, administration administrations re uh, really worked in parallel uh, often. Uh, so was space. It was, um, in the fashion of European colonists, Elsewhere in, in the world, Russians built new cities for themselves alongside older existing um, cities. Uh, uh, these uh, European cities were built to a plan, and that was meant to uh, signify the, rep and represent the superiority of the conquerors and their status as Europeans uh, against the, um, uh, the, the, the backwardness of native society. The best example was Tashkent itself. And here um, you have, okay, Mike. Uh, on the, just this, ah, maybe I could just do this. Um, the, this is the old, old uh, city of Tashkent that is hundreds of years old. I think officially this year we are celebrating the, uh, in, uh, in a couple of years we are celebrating the 2700th anniversary of the oldest pot shards found in, uh, Tashkent, but so it's an old city. The, the Russians come along and built this city, and you can tell the difference in uh, even on this not very detailed map between uh, the plan that here is um, is built in the 1870s, inspired by Saint Petersburg, which in uh, in its own turn had been inspired by by uh, Italian and really by, by Roman cities. So space was divided between European and native sections. So was uh, much of uh, life, uh, and it uh, marks language itself, uh, uh, the Russian language itself. For Uzbek Tashkenters, the old city was um, Shahar, a city, whereas the new city was Gorod. And for, uh, for Russian speakers, when they talked of Tashkent, they meant European Tashkent, not the old city, which remained to them Asiatic Tash uh, Tashkent. And in practical terms, basically, uh, I think they knew more about what went on in St. Petersburg, 2,500 miles away, than they did about what happened in uh, the native part of the city. Um, same with... Um, um, a Russian peasant settlers who came in not massive but substantial numbers were always peasants. Central Asian peasants in Russian were uh, 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 and, uh, and this kind of Orientalism continues to mark the Russian language to this day, actually. I mean, in Russian, Central Asian peasants are never just peasants there, Dikhanin. Um, no, this, I do not want to over this, this duality did not lead to uh, apartheid or residential segregation. Uh, Muslims could and did live in the new cities, although their numbers are hard to judge. Uh, nevertheless, the new cities came to constitute a European space quite distinct from uh, the, the space occupied by, uh, by native cities. And this was uh, this duality was uh, something that the state had no inc in, uh, inclination of 
trying to overdo. If anything, this is precisely the kind of rule of difference that underlay the functioning of the Russian Empire. That was uh, uh, the, uh, what I was describing in more abstract terms earlier. <clears throat> okay. Then we come to revolution. In February of 1917, the Tsar abdicated. And this changed the calculus dramatically. The provisional government that took the Tsar's place in February mo moved very quickly to abolish all distinctions of rank, birth, nationality, religion, social standing, and so forth, and so, uh, so on and so forth, and made central Asians equal citizens of the Russian Republic. And this happened right after in, in March of 1917. But things went much further, and by October, the Bolsheviks were in power, and they had a vision that was even more utterly universalist than that of the, uh, the, the liberals in the provisional government. Uh, and they set out to, um, to transform all societies of the former uh, Russian Empire in the image of the classless utopia of communism that they, had, they saw as their goal. And, this was the fundamental difference between the Tsarists and the Soviet states, and I think this is a pretty substantial one, uh, this claim to universalism. The revolutionary state did not want to, could not by its own light leave, its, leave people alone. It had to, oh, sorry, okay, this, this was supposed to be there for, uh, uh, it's European Tashkent with its boulevards and its uh, wonderful uh, wide open streets that were supposed to be very significant, you know, to show the difference from the labyrinthine alleys of the old city. Okay, um, um, sorry about that. Uh, but the, the state, the revolutionary state, wanted to mobilize its people. Uh, these, uh, a lot of the photographs I show are from, uh, taken by this uh, Russian Jewish photographer who was born in Tashkent called Max Penson, who spent a decade and a half photographing Central Asia in the 1920s and 30s. And these were meant, f uh, they're not really purely documentary photographs. They're meant to show what was to be in socialist, realist terms. The future is now, this is the ideal rather than necessarily the real. But nevertheless, I think these are amazing photographs and I will share them with you. Anyway, but still, the, here's a demonstration. I mean, the Tsarist regime did not have demonstrations. Uh, uh, that this, is the, com this is complete anathema, the complete opposite of oh, how so society was imagined in the Tsarist th uh, dispensation. But the state also, the revolutionary state also, um, and this is a meeting about land reform. And again, th this is perhaps more post than the previous one, but still. Um, it sought to educate them uh, to make them healthy. It's a new regime of medical power that comes in much more strongly than the, had ever been the case before, and to liberate the women. Yes, um, all things that any number of developmentalist nation states in the rest of the 20th century were to attempt. And I think this is one thing to remember about the Soviet Union it was a modernizing developmentalist state, perhaps the first serious one. Um, yet the, um, the Tsarist, um, the Soviets also recognized as self-evident uh, that nations, meaning people who speak different languages, like ethnic nations were real, could not be wished away. And they set in place a number of policies uh, to actually, that eventually ended up um, um, strengthening national languages and national cultures. The final destination was the same for all people, however. Uh, unlike other civilizationalist discourses, you could speak whichever language you want. The final destination of, uh, of all humanity uh, was the same, that of a classless industrial utopia. <clears throat> um, so the problem was to, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Marxists, uh, so the Soviets as Marxists also took for granted that Europe had trodden the path that others behind it, more backward peoples, uh, were fated to follow. Uh, it is a unilinear vision of history. I mean, there's no 
question about that. The problem then became to overcome backwardness and to achieve progress. In the name of universalism, then, the Soviet project aimed at the conquest of difference. And here, this is perhaps what was supposed to be. Here's an, uh, a family of Uzbek peasants. <clears throat> um, and they never, this never entirely transpired, but as an ideal, uh, here's a nuclear family sitting down uh, for dinner. Uh, you know, the, de the decoration and the food is national, but the form, uh, beginning with the, the idea of the nuclear family, is, is uh, universal. Or, 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 or as, the Stalin, as Stalin finally pithily put it, uh, this was supposed to be national in, um, social, national in form and socialist in content. Uh, that the future is socialist, but it will have different nationalist contents. So you could have an, a similar picture of Kazakh peasants or Bashkir peasants or Vietnamese peasants uh, sitting down with eating their own food and their houses decorated, looking similar, but decorated in their national colors. All right, so, so this is the, the, the conquest of difference, the abolition of uh, uh, the conquest of inequality. These were things that were actually quite appealing. And there were many in Central Asian society that um, jumped on the wagon, if you will. Uh, the, in the decade and a half before the revolution, urban society in Central Asia had seen considerable contestation over what direction society should take, what culture it should have. Uh, as a new intelligentsia fascinated with the ideas of progress and civilization had challenged the authority of established elites in society, including established religious elites. Uh, these were the Jadids uh, about whom I have written before. Uh, in, for them, then, 1917 becomes a summons to action, a time to go from the era of words to the era of deeds. Uh, and here was a chance uh, to, um, uh, uh, to put their ideas into action. In 1917 itself, uh, they actually um, uh, attracted quite a bit of opposition. And between the two Russian revolutions of 1917, when there was lots and lots of open politics, uh, the Jadis tended to discover that actually uh, conservative established elites retained a great deal of popularity in society. They lost a lot of elections, and the result of which was to actually radicalize them ever further. Society wasn't listening to their message of salvation. It, uh, they ne it needed more radical measures. And here, this uh, was where their fascination with the revolution came in. So they flocked to revolutionary organs uh, to, um, and, uh, in the hope of using these new institutions of power to, to uh, implement the reform that electoral methods had apparently failed to achieve in 1917. The Bolsheviks, for their part, had no blueprint in hand. They had this idea that finally there is the classless utopia waiting, but how to actually get there in concrete policy terms uh, in 1917 or 18 or 20 or for much of this decade, uh, there, you know, it was it was all to be discovered. Um, if, uh, and it, this is what allowed uh, some sort of collaboration or cooperation between local intellectuals. Uh, reformist, modernizing intellectuals and the Bolshevik regime. There were uh, lots of issues. The, however, in that collaboration, the lexicon of class politics that the Bolsheviks used were this idea of competing classes of exploitation, of, uh, uh, of revolution, uh, had no resonance in Central Asia. There had been no... Um, no socialist uh, propaganda, no so socialist um, uh, discourses in native society in Central Asia. <clears throat> um, uh, and so for a lot of these intellectuals, the fascination lay with revolution, not with any class analysis. So for them, it's a revolution, uh, they, they adopted revolution, but without class in it. And there lay the road 
to a lot of differences down the road. Uh, but it, the revolution did bring in a lot of uh, the, the Jadis, the pre-revolutionary intellectuals, but it also ushered in a whole lot of other people into action, most prominent of whom perhaps was the Kazakh, uh, Turar Eskulov, uh, who had gone to a Russian school, was an agronomist. Uh, in 1917, he was all of 23 years old. And most people we talk about are all 20-somethings. <clears throat> uh, and um, it was, uh, and with no previous experience or involvement or investment in Muslim cultural reform like most of the Jadids had. And it was people like him uh, with their Russian educations who were to figure very prominently in those who joined Soviet organs and, joined, uh, and became communists in this decade. The Russian had become a key asset. Uh, without a, a possession of fluent Russian, you could not actually function in the, uh, in the new real arenas of political action that had been opened up, and which is what um, uh, opened the, uh, uh, the path to people such as Riskulov. Um, but eventually, um, and oh, uh, the irony perhaps was that most of these people, uh, the people who uh, worked in Soviet institutions, who especially in the leadership in leadership positions uh, in the party, uh, all came from uh, Russian schools which by definition pretty much meant that they also had, came from affluent urban backgrounds. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you could see that there, this is an older political, uh, older class coming into power through revolutionary organs. The difference was, however, in their youth. N um, scarcely anyone that I will mention uh, in this talk uh, in the 1930s, uh, started the, revol the Soviet period on the other side of 30. These, the, in some ways, the revolution allowed 20-something men to transform their society. So there is an age, uh, there is a generational revolution going on in which young, not necessarily angry, but impatient young men seize this opportunity to to, uh, to uh, practice the transformative uh, politics. <sighs> okay, so they were fascinated by revolution, but what did they make of class or, or Marx or the dialectic? Very little, as a matter of fact. They, they imagined the nation, rather than any particular class, as the crucial vector of the revolution, even though if the exact boundaries of that nation remained in flux. And over the course of the decade, it became, or the first several years of the Soviet period, it became, uh, the, the nation came to be imagined in increasingly in an ethnic fashion so that by the time we, the boundaries are drawn in 1924 on, that, that, on the map that I just showed, uh, those um, really are uh, ethno-territorial boundaries uh, of each of the, the republics is supposed to be the homeland of an ethnically defined nation. But the, uh, whatever the actual content of the nation was the idea of the nation that seemed, seemed to have triumphed in, in the imaginations of these intellectuals. <clears throat> and, um, okay, so, so many joined the party, such as Ruskulov. Uh, others did not join the party always. And joining the party, I mean, in a one-party state, uh, uh, basically joining the party was to join the, uh, the elect. Uh, the, joining the Communist Party was not simply a matter of signing a form and paying your dues. You had to go through a, a lengthy period of uh, probation where your behavior was checked, your identity ideological commitment had to be approved of and so on and so forth. So joining the party was um, not entirely simply a matter of um, just signing up. Others, however, uh, did not join uh, the party, but nevertheless threw themselves into action, in the re especially in the realm of culture. The years after the revolution are a period of great, great literary creativity, uh, especially in Uzbekistan. And it's not too much to say that the 1920s were the decade when modern Uzbek culture took shape. 
when the language was, uh, was, became what it is, when the novel arose, when you know, press and journalism uh, took on, and, and the theater especially. And here uh, are some of the people, oops, uh, that uh, figured very large in my research. Abdul Hamid Suleiman, uh, who wrote under the pen name of Cholpan, uh, was born in 1898. At the age of 19, he was uh, already one of the most uh, popular poets in uh, Central Asia. He, it was not just that he wrote poetry that was very popular. He redefined the language of poetry. He the new poetic forms uh, of, uh, that uh, represented in many ways a revolt against the tradition of uh, Persianate poetry that had been the dominant paradigm in Central Asia for uh, several centuries. Uh, at the use of the living language of, uh, uh, and, and not the uh, uh, per Persianate or Arabianate language of conventional poetry, and the use of new um, meters and rhymes often borrowed from folk poetry. Um, he was also a playwright and a translator who translated uh, through the Russian, sometimes through, uh, uh, through Turkish, uh, a number of authors, including the first Uzbek translation of Hamlet. <coughs> um, here's Abdul Rauf Fitrat, uh, for whom, okay, this, the, sorry, the resolution has gone berserk here. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a very nice photograph of him, but not uh, here. Um, another uh, major figure who looms very large in my work, who, um, uh, started off as a, a, a pamphleteer, became a playwright, and then after some political troubles, devoted the last 15 years of his life to, uh, to researching Uzbek as a language. And here is um, Abdullah Qadiri, uh, who was the man that Chris Murphy and I were talking about all those years ago that led me down this path. Um, he, published the first Uzbek novel in 1925. He's also a journalist, uh, a satirist, and, um, uh, and again, it was in the 1920s that his uh, creativity uh, sort, uh, um, sort of peaked. And between the three of these figures, uh, they basically define modern Uzbek uh, literary culture and the language itself. But there were, there were others, and there was a period of, um, when all sorts of new forms uh, were uh, coming about, all sorts of experimentation. In, um, and here's one picture that's from the collection of the library itself, uh, a page from a, <laughs> my favorite page from a little book of children's poetry uh, that was illustrated in full color basically uh, published in 1926, the first Uzbek illustrated children's book uh, done by a fellow called Elbeck. And that, uh, I think the, the inspiration is from a series of Russian fables, but the translation is into uh, a, 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 a modern Uzbek for children. So this is a, a separate genre of children's writing um, again, this, I, I think well, the, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, with translating Hamlet and writing illustrated books for children and, uh, and an intense preoccupation with your own historical uh, self, there is a re revolution of the mind that, uh, uh, that takes place in uh, this decade um, in which the, in, the Native in, uh, intelligentsia is, 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 is fully complicit. Okay, um, one other thing. So uh, the driving force behind all of this was service to the nation, that you create Hamlet in Uzbek, so Uzbeks can be part of a universal civilization. You, you write beautiful books for children so they can be uh, educated along 
what were seen as universal lines. But the good of the nation also required struggle against what was usually called reaction or counter-revolution within, within the nation itself. The, uh, the cause of the nation is never without internal conflict. I think uh, we, tend, we err when if we think that nationalists are only just thumping patriots. They might be just thumping patriots, but uh, in order for the nation to succeed, it has to shape up. And it's national elites that tell the nation to shape up. Uh, and um, few national movements are embodiments of unity and harmony. Nor was the case here. Uh, that for the, the good of the nation required um, uh, struggle against conservatives, against reactionaries, so-called. Uh, I, I can put all the quotation marks around these uh, these adjectives, but this is how uh, and and which is uh, what is use, useful. Um, for us in really understanding the scope of the action of these uh, um, uh, this modernizing elite, it acted to reshape its own society as much as it sought to improve it. Um, the revolution was above all, how, and as far as the Soviets were concerned then, the revolution for the local intelligentsia had become basically a national allegory. It, uh, it, the re revolution, as far as the local intelligence was concerned, was to give the nation its place in the sun. And here, uh, communists and non-communists among the local intelligence, they might differ from one another on many things, but they shared a passion uh, for the nation. All right. But, and this is an important but, uh, the enthusiasm of, for the possibilities opened up by the revolution were felt most keenly by the Central Asians themselves. Russians in Central Asia, settlers or soldiers of occupation in 1917, saw the universalism of the revolution as a grave threat. In 1917, when the revolution first happened, that this spread of democracy by, that, by the revolution was actually a grave threat to their, the privileged position of, of, uh, of the colonial population. And indeed, uh, the, the first Soviet government in Tashkent uh, had explicitly excluded the local population uh, from, uh, uh, from its ranks, ostensibly because there were no Muslim, native Muslim proletarian organizations. So it was the central government in Moscow that uh, then actually forced uh, the Tashkent uh, settler communists, basically, to include the Muslims, uh, include the Muslim population of Central Asia. Uh, but beyond that, the, the real enthusiasm for the revolution was really felt by the local intelligentsia. Bolshevik leaders tended to be very hard-nosed about what Central Asia meant to them. <clears throat> also, they had a very ambitious agenda of reform, but seldom the resources to, uh, to match up. So ambitions routinely outran uh, reality. The uh, Soviet economy was across the board was massively uh, devastated by seven years of war and civil war and revolution uh, from 1914. Remember, uh, the revolution happened in the middle of the First World War to 1922. There were eight years, seven and a half years of constant warfare in Russia, uh, in Central Asia as well. And so when the Soviets emerged, when the Bolsheviks emerged, rulers of um, uh, all of the Soviet Union, they actually, uh, the economy in 1921 was about 13% of where it had been in 1913, the last year of war. So lack of resources was a massive uh, problem to the point where even the Red Army um, had lived, often lived off the land and institutions were chronically uh, short of funds. I've seen memos from the education ministry in Tashkent to Moscow saying that uh, actually per capita funding for education was higher in 1913 than it was in 1923 by quite a bit, uh, even when the Tsarist uh, uh, regime actually had no in intention of offering public education to anyone. So, uh, so that was one thing. The, there's a general lack of um, resources, quite a bit of foot dragging from 
Europeans, Russians, and other Europeans in Central Asia. But there was the more fundamental fact that ultimately for cent Central Asia's importance to Moscow lay in its economic resources, especially cotton. Uh, this placed the Soviet regime in direct continuity with the Tsarist Empire, and this is where the empire looms largest in the, Soviet, in the 1920s. In the immediate aftermath of the revolution, central authorities wanted access to uh, Central Asia's cotton, without which Russia's textile industry could not function. In the longer term, Turkestan's uh, Central Asia's resources were to play an important part in the Soviet state's economic assumptions. By 1925, it was quite obvious that the Soviet economy, economy would be isolationist or autarkic. That, and this is well before Stalin sort of declared socialism in one country as the, as the ideological imperative. In, in actual practice of economic planners by 1925, it was quite obvious that the Soviet economy would be autarkic and therefore based on regional specialization within the vast and sprawling country. And in that system of regional specialization, Central Asia's job was to provide raw materials, most, uh, mostly agricultural, some mining, and most of all, cotton. And cotton is, was used for textile, but it, textiles, but it also had all sorts of military uses, from uniforms to its use in ammunition. So it also had a strategic uh, significance. By 1929, the Soviet Union had officially declared cotton independence as a policy goal. And it became then the job of Central Asia to provide it, uh, to focus its agriculture entirely on cotton. Uh, the, the state promised it caught, uh, wheat from elsewhere, from Russia or from Siberia, where cotton could not be grown, so that every single square inch uh, of Central Asian arable land could be used for, for cotton. That, at least, was the, the goal. At the same time, it was, by 1925, it was also clear that industrialization in Central Asia will have to wait, and that in the foreseeable future, Central Asia would re remain the supplier of raw materials. This uh, proved very, very contentious, among, especially among uh, supporters of the revolution in Central Asia. And this led to a great deal of discontent and grumbling. Um, tensions between Europeans and natives had remained pr uh, a pronounced feature of this decade anyway, but it was cotton that tended to like, bring matters uh, uh, to the fore. Um, in, by, by the middle of the 1920s, uh, secret police agents began reporting whispered statements by party members, uh, and not to mention others, uh, that Uzbekistan, uh, as the supplier of cotton, was merely a red colony, or a socialist colony, no better and perhaps even worse than Egypt or India under British rule. Egypt was the other great cotton economy, actually. A certain Mirza Rahimov tendered his resignation from the party in 1928 because he disagreed with the party's nationalities policy. Uzbekistan is a socialist colony. He wrote, he actually sent this back off to the party in his letter of resignation, which by 1928 was already a heroic deed. Uh, Uzbekistan is a socialist colony and has no independence. It would be, it, it, it would be independent if it were like Egypt or Afghanistan. The head of the government, Comrade Ahun Babaev, is a puppet in the hands of Moscow." End quote. Another communist, a, a, a Tashkent student at a communist academy, uh, and there were these academies for training, good, uh, uh, giving higher ideological education to, their, to party members. A Tashkent student asked at a meeting, what is the difference between the English colony of India and the administration of Kazakhstan by Galashokin? who was the, the man in charge of imposing the cotton uh, quotas in Kazakhstan. So, so there was, um, and, and these are party members within the, the, the select elite. Outside the party, the disenchantment was even greater. 
um, as was the vengeance wreaked on that dissent by the, part, uh, by the party and the secret police. In 1926, the party opened what it called an ideological front. The, the parties uh, and the Soviet regimes Language had been militarized by the experience of the Civil War, which was the founding moment of the... So everything was a front, or a, an assault, or a, mm, uh, this or that. Uh, so an ideological front was opened against what it called the old intellectuals, meaning uh, the Jadids and the Fitrit and Cholpan and uh, uh, Qadri, the people whose pictures you just... And so the Jadids, uh, who, the, the name Jadid means the proponent of the new, and they uh, had earned that name by uh, 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 advocating the, a new method of uh, teaching literacy in, um, in, in, in elementary schools. So the Jadids had gone from being new to being old inside a decade <coughs> as a group. Um, insistent calls began to issue forth for watchfulness about their misdeeds and for replacing them by a real Soviet intelligentsia even though th this latter uh, comprised only school teachers and minor clerks and um, uh, sometimes even policemen uh, as uh, any, any source loyal to the Soviet regime. Uh, a full-blown campaign against what was called bourgeois nationalism uh, was unleashed in 1929. It lasted until 1931 and took special aim at uh, the Commissariat of Education, which was supposed to be a, a den of nationalists. Uh, and the result of this campaign that lasted for about two years was mass arrests, uh, firings, uh, a few executions. Most of the executions were to come in 1937 and 1938, but 1929 to 31 was the first major purge uh, of the nationalist intelligentsia that cleared out basically a two generations of uh, then uh, of, uh, the, of the Central Asian intelligentsia. <clears throat> Nationalism remained the prime accusation to be hurled against uh, uh, Muslim or Central Asian communists accused of anything, all the way down to 1938, which is the end of the Great Terror in the Soviet Union. Uh, th there were no analogous trials of uh, European or Russian party members for the other. The, there was a counterpart to bourgeois nationalism, which was called great power chauvinism, but there were no real campaigns and no real trials for great power chauvinism in Central Asia. Uh, so this thus ends, in, and, and this is where I end my book in 1931 with this, this campaign against uh, the bourgeois nationalism of the old intellectuals, which, uh, for which some of them paid very dearly. The three people whose pictures, the four people whose pictures you saw all survived that one. Uh, they all died in 1938 at the hands of the, uh, at that time it was called the NKVD, uh, the, the, the secret police. Uh, but most other, uh, the nature of intellectual and cultural life was utterly transformed after 1931. The, the kind of freedom and experimentation that had uh, characterized much of the 1920s was a thing of the past. Uh, the, uh, the state had managed to define the parameters of debate, and it had done that uh, not just through the secret police and its executioners, but also through creation, uh, the creation of a new generation uh, uh, the, of, of what it called the real Soviet intelligentsia, people trained entirely within uh, Soviet time and having absolutely no connection to any pre-revolutionary discourses. All right, so, um, so there you have it. Um, um, both the, the ambitions and the hopes of the 1920s and their squelching and the persistence of empire in the form of cotton. And this picture, which was, um, I'm not entirely sure how to read it, uh, except only in a post-Soviet manner as what Cotton did to Central Asia. And I think this, the pose here is supposed to be some sort of uh, like joyful uh, exultance, but uh, the guy also looks quite dead to me. Um, so we can read it whichever way we want. But I do want to wrap up with a couple of uh, sort of conclusions about what to make of these two decades. 
uh, <clears throat> there are, uh, I mean, I, I, I talked about the enthusiasm of the revolution, but also the persistence of empire and its habitus that lingered on, especially for the Europeans in, who lived in Central Asia. So the easy way out might be to say that the Soviet effort failed, that nothing really much happened, Central Asia survived. And this argument has been made from various different directions with various different politics behind each of those. There is the notion of a failed transformation that American Sovietologists were very fond of. That. And then that has come back in new guises since then that the Soviets basically failed. I mean, the, I, well, they might or might not have failed, but that still does leaves out the possibility that enormous changes did take place in Central Asia, and which is what I've tried to point out. Uh, today in post-Soviet Russia, the argument often is that, well, the Central Asian with its uh, essential Asiaticness and essential Muslimness uh, basically defeated all Soviet attempts at, trans uh, at changing it um, and defeated all civilizing missions and so on and so forth, which is a deeply, deeply conservative argument that also denies all connection to empire or all responsibility for anything that might have happened there. And there's an argument that even that, um, that um, socialism was domesticated, indigenized, nativized, uh, that local elites colonize Soviet institutions. To a certain extent, I have some sympathy for that, though it's good to remember that this idea of Soviet institutions being colonized by local elites comes actually from the pages of um, secret police uh, denunciations and analyses. Um, there's something about the indigenization of Soviet power that I find appealing, though I think much of that happens really in the 50s and the 60s rather than in this period of, of, um, of, of upheaval. However, <clears throat> so, so these are some of the explanations. I don't find any of them particularly um, convincing uh, because uh, they still... Um, want to rescue some sort of continuity in Central Asia's uh, history, uh, I would rather ta uh, emphasize the ruptures and what is new. Uh, revolution might not have triumphed quite in the way that I had described it at the beginning, it, that the, 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 uh, the utter re reef the utter transformation of everything, the recreation of society, the remaking of man might not have happened in quite the same way, but massive transformation did take place in this decade. Society was mobilized as never before. Um, the state sought to reach, it may, uh, um, to, to, to get peasants to grow what the state wanted to grow, to make people send their children to school, make, make people uh, become functionally literate, uh, have a new regime of, um, uh, disc of public health discourse and policy. The ambitions were all there. The, the problem was <clears throat> with um, execution, with lack of resources. Um, second, that the revolution did create a new political class. Uh, sometimes despite itself, but basically you, the, the old classes that had dominated Central Asian societies in, under Tsarist rule were largely displaced uh, by a new cohort of Central Asians, some of whom might have been, might have had the same social background, many didn't, but, uh, but even the ones who did come from elite families um, really were also a product of a generational revolt uh, that if society has been transformed, uh, is being transformed as it was in the 1920s by, you know, gangs of 20-something mm, uh, students, well, that is really not quite the same as saying that traditional elites have uh, taken control of Central Asian, uh, or, or, or of Soviet institutions. And finally, new regimes of power, of economic and political power, uh, had become established. And this is uh, an argument I'm actually 
going to make, I'm still documenting that, that in 1929, the back of the local economy, uh, 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 of any possible source of opposition to Soviet regime had largely been broken. Uh, the, the secret police documentation is full of how our enemies are very well organized and they are about to pounce on us and so on and so forth, this, uh, this feeling of weakness. And yet, really, um, I do not see any other force that could have um, taken on the Soviet. So Soviet power was really quite well entrenched by 1932 in Central Asia. Uh, and yet that power for all its revolutionary um, impulses also retained a good deal of the habitus of empire in it, especially in the form of cotton. In 1932, when I end my book, then Central Asia remained suspended between empire and revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here for questions. Uh, I'm not done yet. <laughs> yes, Chris. Oh, there's a floating mic. I can hear you. No, not really. No. Uh, and, and yeah, four. That's the much bigger one, actually. Um, I think the comparison I had drawn was actually between structures of empire and not structures of anti-colonial anti inte uh, intellectual thought. The, in terms of structures of empire, the, uh, and again, I think that what I argue, uh, I didn't make a very strong case for it here, but I've done it in, in print, that, that 1917 marks a, a, a turning point. And then the Soviet rule is actually quite unlike British rule in India in its uh, impulse to mobilize. And, and, and it's, if anything, it sees itself as a uh, very much an anti-imperial, anti-colonial uh, uh, power. So th the parallels to be drawn are between how the Russian, the Tsarist state treated Central Asia, and, and, and there the parallels are very clear with um, how the British state ran, the British Indian state ran India. Uh, except that the Indian, the British were there in some parts for 300 years and the Russians there only for 50, but some of the basic assumptions about difference, the inherence of difference, uh, were there. As far uh, as, far as anti-colonial or nationalist intellectuals are concerned, there's some Indian Muslim connection, but really the main uh, inspiration for Central Asians was, was the Ottoman Empire. Uh, or um, in some other ways, other Muslim communities of the Russian Empire like the Tatars and the Azerbaijanis. Uh, so, and actually, uh, before 1917, even Russian influences are much uh, weaker. I mean, that, that's a really sort of an unusual thing for a, in the history of colonialism that colonial intellectuals in Central Asia were, uh, very few of them were actually trained in Russian universities. Uh, it was different among the Tatars and the Azerbaijanis, but in Central Asia, uh, the Ottoman Empire was the number one source of, uh, the main model 
Oh, yeah. Okay, in that order. I, that's how I spotted you. Oh no, that, that's a that's a great question, and um, actually the most am amazing thing about 1917 itself is that no one wanted independence. Well, other than the Poles and the and the Finns, and they got it mostly because the Germans had already occupied them in the war. So it was much easier to to get away with your independence. Um, but beyond that, for a lot of people, the promise of the const of the first of the February Revolution and uh, the uh, and uh, uh, was very was very great, and so the idea of that there will be a constituent assembly that would uh, where through a direct equal universal vote everybody would you know f figure this out figure things out I mean that proved very 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 um, uh, tenuous even three years into the civil war often people said well the, you know when the civil the russian civil war was this complete total mayhem with like hundreds of fronts and hundreds of participants but people would say okay well you know the solution uh, to this is to get the bolsheviks out and go back to the constituent assembly but and here's the but that in 1918 in central asia once the so uh, the Soviets had taken over both in Moscow and then European settlers had taken over power in the name of the Soviets in, in Central Asia. Then a lot of these people began to, uh, to think that this is not going to work. And in, for about eight months, uh, there was a great deal of hope of some sort of foreign intervention. And this is while the war still went on and the Germans and the Ottomans were still fighting. And so there are these missions that go to meet the Ottomans in, in Turkey, in, in Istanbul, or in, when they held Baku briefly. But then that came to naught once both the Germans and the Ottomans collapsed. So after that, really, uh, the, the Russian parameters of the, the political structure were question far less than you think. And this is, one of, again, one of those um, somewhat unusual things about this. Uh, yes, please. This may be a No, th that was, um, I mean, no, no that, was, that was a little bit later. I mean, in, 19, in these years, I mean, there was total mayhem going on. I mean, mayhem is the only word in the English language that really uh, gives a, a sense of uh, Central Asia in the years of the, between 1917 and 1920. That, the, the forcible relocations, there are many. They were uh, for different uh, reasons. The, Within, there were no major population movements in Central Asia. There were places in Tajikistan where people were flushed, you know, driven out of mountains to go farm cotton in, in the lowlands. And then after, towards the end of the Second World War in 1944, a bunch of yeah, na national groups, small, uh, uh, small in population, were relocated mostly from the Caucasus into Central Asia because they were accused as national groups, as whole nations, of having collaborated with the Germans. Mm. So, so that, that, but that came much later. One of those were, were the Chechens, who was perhaps of all those, the ones we know the best today. And a lot of the uh, Chechen grievances have to do with that searing experience. 
All right, because, oh, I mean, uh, they want, I think the critique of local society that had arisen before the revolution was, was to answer the question, uh, why were we colonized? Why did the Russians come and conquer us? And this is sort of the fundamental question most colonized people have asked, uh, and, or, or semi-colonized people have asked. And the answer was, well, we need to reform for the sake of self-strengthening if we want to have, take our place in the sun as, as, alongside other nations, whether as sovereign entities or whether as you know, a, a, a nation that has its own language and its own elites and, and its own culture, just like all the powers in the world that are strong. Uh, that, uh, for that, you need to do all of these things. You need to reshape society. You need to get people, you know, raise levels of literacy from th what it, whatever it was, maybe 3% to, you know, have an educated workforce. All of those things that so many modernizing movements have, have sought. Um, I mean, none of that is really terribly uh, unusual, right? No, because otherwise someone will come and conquer your country and turn you into slaves. Uh, I mean, I think that that. Uh, yeah, man, you can't. Uh, and well, I, I think what I was trying to, I suppose, one of the things I want to do in the book is to sort of remind ourselves that actually that. Exactly the question that you're asking is very, in some ways very much a 21st century question that no one in the early 20th century had the, well, no educated, nationally conscious person had any doubt about what the answer was to be. That without self-strengthening, you'll be the doormat of history. And, no one, you know, and if you don't want to be the doormat of history, then you have to do all of those things. You have to reshape society. And I, I think now perhaps we have, especially perhaps in the West, we have the luxury to ask the question what it's all about. And maybe a lot of people still, uh, I mean, Edward Said says somewhere that you know, for all the, the Western Ac academy's fascination with postmodernity. Most people in the in the so-called third world are still very keen on modernity. Um, so I, I think it's really as simple as that. That uh, what to, to me what this was interesting about this is the universalism of this. That at that time in these the idea uh, of sort of a different civilizational path to modernity was not really, did not have very much traction. You have to be like them, to beat them at their own game. And whereas today, I mean, a lot, both in the West and elsewhere, you have these civilizational discourses about what kind of civilization do we want and what does it mean to have, you know, is there an Islamic path or a Chinese path or an Asian path? None of that was really very big at this time. And, the, and that's the universalism of it that I was talking about. No, I, 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 was, I was actually... No, I mean, I think in some ways all are a little different, but examine mean, the Chinese experiences, the, the, the the 800 pound gorilla example of the, the same sort of thing. I think you suppose so. Uh-huh. 
Uh -huh. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, and, and the answer to that would be who you were in the old city. And again, I think as, as these modernizing intellectuals found out in 1917, a lot of people actually didn't um, really share the, the anxieties that, uh, that these modernizers had about, and they're fine being what they were. And so for the modernizing elites, then that, that becomes a problem to be solved, that you know, the nation doesn't see its own good. So, but to get back to your, uh, to your question, uh, for a lot of people, I mean, their life was what, what it was, and they had no desire, uh, because that, that understanding of space brought with it all sorts of social relations that were built into the built environment, actually, that, are, that uh, the, the urban neighborhood, the mahalla, is not just a physical construct, but it brings with it all sorts of reciprocal social relations and all of that. Um, there are some that had a little bit of there is evidence of some envy, and then out of quite a bit of annoyance that actually uh, the two cities were treated sort of separately so that electrification came to, Tash you know, to European Tashkent, the tramway, it had a tramway by 1906, I think, uh, and, and all of that, it had parks, it had more per capita expenditure, so there was that. And then there was the, uh, it was, as I said, it was not apartheid in any sense, so a lot of wealthy Tashkenters would actually build a house there. And uh, sometimes they'll have a foot in both sides, sometimes they'll just move. And that happened quite a bit more after 1917, obviously. So does that sort of answer your question? All right, I think that's that. Two more, okay. Well, then, if we keep it really far, maybe we can squeeze, squeeze in a third. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, uh, that's a very good question. I would say that, I'm not entirely sure that, uh, I mean, it's not that the Muslim intellectuals I was talking about today were not committed to Islam. Some of them did get very, very disaffected, and by the end of the 1920s, also, sorts of things had, uh, had happened. There was actually Muslim anti-clericalism and Muslim atheism by the end of the 1920s. But um, the, the way, uh, 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 for some of them, uh, is, the salvation of Islam lay in radical reform. For others, uh, the Bolsheviks were just um, a menace. And a menace, though, again, not to, they were not really perhaps to Islam as much as the customary way of life, which was identical to Islam for them. So uh, there were, I mean, I've focused in this talk only on, on the modernizing intellectuals. There was a vast array of other uh, reactions uh, to, uh, to Bolshevism. The, the funniest thing is that, of course, the most violent reactions came from the Basmachi, the, uh, the peasants in this time of state collapse. The old uh, Muslim literati, the, the literary groups with, uh, who are not modernists, tended to have this sort of a bemused detachment more than anything else. Uh, and because uh, I, I suppose it was not their land that was being requisitioned perhaps. Or, and so there is uh, something that needs to be studied there uh, about exactly why they made actually rather little of the revolution than you'd think. 
Yes. Oh, the Cyrillic was in 1939, but there was a, a Latinization in 1928, which is uh, the exact same year as uh, it happened in Turkey. That was in uh, that was 1926. Yeah, that was Arabic. So. It was, I mean, that's a very, very long story there of uh, a reform of the Arabic alphabet itself for, for 10 years, and then Latinization in 1928, which was all seen as really the work, it was the work of local, in, of Turkic intellectuals, and uh, in the, that we need to make it, the reform of the alphabet and then Latinization would make Lit, the acquisition of functional literacy easier. And that is exactly why it was done, imposed in Turkey as well in 1928 in exactly the same year. Cyrillic was a somewhat different matter because that was, there was no discussion, there was no debate, it sort of came from on high and that was the difference between the Soviet Union of 1928 and the Soviet Union of 1938. All right. Can we have one very quick one question? Last yeah. one. This is the very last one. Okay, well, no, the, I mean, cotton in some ways is the, the big story perhaps, and uh, that we can talk about cultural transformation and all of that, but the back, you know, the material base of everything was, was uh, was um, cotton, and basically cotton agriculture and everything, all the credit relations that su supported it had collapsed in the, during the war and the civil war, uh, the revolution and the civil war. And a lot of the irrigation networks had collapsed. So the Soviets actually did spend quite a bit of time uh, and, and money bringing, putting it back on its feet. But at, that was uh, also in order to make the area fit for cotton. And, uh, to the p and uh, there was both a fair bit of coercion, and it all changed in 1929 with collectivization. Uh, then you basically abolished private property in the countryside, you turn uh, people into, uh, you know, move them into collectives, and then basically the state is a monopoly buyer of everything and a monopoly supplier of, uh, of uh, agricultural implements. So it gives it a very good, puts it in a very good position to force people to grow whatever it tells them to grow. So after 29, it's just, you know, with the abolition of the market and all of that. Before that, there were incentives. But there's also a quite a good bit of coercion even before that. And the state had become the, the solitary buyer of cotton by about 1925. And it could set the price. And um, one of the things that uh, there's uh, Ruskulov actually, the first guy whose picture I had, he once made uh, in a speech demanded that the center pay world prices to Turkestan for its cotton. And that was one of the biggest things against him that was brought up back when he was tried in 1938. Uh, so, so it was, um, when there, there were some incentives, but quite a bit of coercion as well, even before, uh, be before collectivization. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking our speaker and proceed to reception. <laughs>